Hearns and also a co-PI for the Hearn Coordinating Center. We'll tell you about that in a minute. And today's webinar focuses on the HPAP pancreas database called PANCDB. I'll explain those acronyms in a minute. And our presenters are from the University of Pennsylvania that created the PANCDB. Um, Babak Farabi put together the slides for today, most some of them. Unfortunately, he's not able to join. So Golnaz Vaidi will be uh, giving her and his uh, portion of the talks, along with Colin McGovern and Michael Stauffer, all from University of Pennsylvania. So let's get started with a brief introduction about Hearn and an overview. Oh, okay, now my, uh, my screen will not move forward. Let's see. Mm -hmm. This is good, there we go. Okay, so um, a, a little background. Uh, the Human Islet Research Network, Hearn, began in 2014. It's ongoing today. Here's a diagram of the consortia involved. We have the, oh, the, on the left here, the consortium on beta cell death and survival, a consortium on modeling autoimmune interactions, CMI. CHIB is the consortium on human islet biomimetics. CTAR is targeting and regeneration of beta cells. And the HIREC is our group in the center here, the Human Islet Research Enhancement Center, which serves as the facilitator for this research. And then over on the top left is HPAC, the Human Pancreas Analysis Consortium. Um, today, the HIREC involves over 200 investigators across 85 institutions in nine different countries. And our talk today is <clears throat> a database generated through the HPAC uh, or the HPAP, or Human Pancreas Analysis Program, component of HPAC. Here's our team for the HIREC. Um, John Cadiz and I are the co-PIs of the Coordinating Center. Leila Rouse is our full-time excellent program manager. Sandy Bashir just joined us recently as a research data curator. Dave Coe helps with our technical issues and Nellie Berger is our project assistant. So there are many benefits to HERN. The, the goal is to accelerate progress in type one diabetes research and the consortium structure that it's in provides benefits to scientists, research team, and the entire research community. It's a, a morphing, evolving uh, structure as we need new goals and new scientists. There are new offerings of RFAs and additional uh, talent that comes in. So we attract new talent. We share our discoveries, develop technologies, promote interactions, test ideas, Importantly, we train the next generation. So we offer new investigator awards at different rounds of grant offerings and network and foster collaborations like today, sharing with you the tools that Hearn has developed. Um, if you want to learn more about the consortium, we publish every other year now an executive summary report. This is the cover artwork and the announcement on our website, which is listed here, Hearn Network with one N. Dot org, and you can go there and download this and some previous year's executive summaries if you'd like to understand more about the consortium. And we have resources out there for everyone in the diabetes community, um, including the Hearn Resource Browser, which is also on our, our website. And it provides access to a collection of important resources for your research data sets, bioreagents, documents, technology. There are 18 different resource types catalog in these categories that you see here, including over 1800 entries to date. We're going to feature this research browser and a couple of investigators who have utilized and contributed to it in the next um, Hearn webinar, which is going to be later this month on July 21st, if you're interested in learning more about these resources and how you can access them and take advantage of them for your own experiments. We also have uh, tutorials and webinar videos out posted out there. So all the past webinars, if you missed any of them, you can go back and view them. And this one today is also going to be recorded and posted. So let's give the outline for today's webinar. And we're going to discuss an introduction to the human pancreas analysis program. And then the group will give an overview of their pancreas database called PancDB. 
and then a live demonstration if the technology gods are with us of the paint db and their latest enhancements they've just launched v2 and a few uh, housekeeping reminders the presentation as i said is being recorded and will be posted on youtube so please mute your audio and turn off your video during the presentation and save up your questions there will be a discussion at the end you can use the chat function or raise your hand and unmute to ask questions. But let's please wait till the end so they can get through a smooth demonstration. And then I think we'll leave plenty of time for discussion. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Golnaz who will begin the presentation. I will stop sharing now. <clears throat> Golnaz. Um, thank you so much, uh, Joyce. Um, do you guys see my slides? Yes, we do. And you can hear me. Okay, wonderful. Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is uh, Golnaz Vahedi. I'm an associate professor of genetics at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it is my honor to present on behalf of the Human Pancreas Analysis Program, in particular, my colleague, Babak Fariabi, who directs the uh, PANCDB, who was unable to uh, join to join us today, uh, an overview of PANCDB and also some of the uh, more updated uh, progress that we have made over the last few months. Uh, if you are working on pancreatic tissues really as it relates to type 1 or type 2 diabetes, perhaps uh, I don't have to really provide the, the rationale for the, or the need for having um, um, a database for uh, pancreatic tissues, but uh, there, it is clear that major constraints that doesn't allow us to really understand the uh, molecular basis of uh, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes is really the inability to safely biopsy human pancreatic uh, tissues. And uh, in the case of type 1 diabetes, uh, beta cells, which are the major uh, cells targeted by the immune cells and destroyed, um, th there is very little amount of the beta cell mass left in type 1D individuals as they are diagnosed. So uh, studying these cells and really better uh, defining the molecular processes that happens for their destruction uh, is challenging considering the absence of these important cell types. So to address these challenges, uh, a few years ago, uh, the NIDDK, uh, uh, the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive uh, Kidney Disease at the NIH, established a program called Human Pancreas Analysis Program, or uh, abbreviated as HPAP, with this mission to uh, generate high-quality tissues and really use uh, the cutting edge and modern molecular techniques to better understand what are really the molecular events that happen and uh, particularly at early time points uh, as uh, uh, during the disease and also during disease progression that leads to uh, loss of beta cells. And this uh, program has also then expanded to uh, type 2 diabetes and is really a fascinating uh, collaborative effort am am among many institutions, including uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, University of Florida, Vanderbilt, University of Alberta, Stanford, and uh, Mount Sinai. So um, while the HPAP program uh, is uh, put together to uh, collect pancreatic tissues, perform molecular analyses, uh, and distribute various uh, uh, tissues and uh, data associated with this, uh, the PANCDB is a database that really collects and accumulates all these highly, uh, very valuable uh, measurements uh, for pancreatic tissues and also as it relates to immune uh, compartment in a free and publicly accessible manner. Manner. But the team has really taken the, uh, has a very ambitious goal, and we really want to actually help the uh, diabetes community to, uh, to analyze, explore, interact, and also use these data sets to publish and uh, really advance the uh, diabetes research field. And maybe uh, we, we, will, we would like to share with you some of our early efforts on this uh, interactivity and the ability to analyze these type of data sets across different donors and tissues. And we really are committed to in, uh, invest on these efforts and expand these uh, type of activities in future. So we uh, are really uh, uh, fortunate to have an amazing team composed of computer scientists, data cura curators, software engineers, and uh, computational biologists, uh, uh, which are 
uh, span between uh, my lab and uh, Babak Faryabi's lab. And this really has uh, been critical for us to be able to uh, span various aspects of this uh, database as it relates to uh, creating really a modern uh, website for uh, the ability to download and also interact with uh, various measurements. So PankDB as a glance, uh, we have collected about uh, 126 donors uh, distributed across type 1D, type 2D, and non-diabetic controls. Uh, and uh, there are many assays, and we are expanding on the number of assays and uh, very quickly adapting to the bleeding edge of the technology as we move forward, especially with the single cell technologies. And some of these assays are listed, and you will hear uh, in more details about uh, maybe some uh, specifics of these uh, during our interactive sessions. The PankDB data has been used across many different publications, and one of our primary missions is really to enable you and the uh, uh, diabetes community to use these data sets as uh, easily as you can. And please let us know if there are any ways that we can facilitate that uh, in moving forward. So. We have a, so maybe you were, if, if you're hearing about HPAP and PankDB for the first time, you might be wondering what is this uh, 2.0. A uh, few months ago, we had a, a major upgrade, which uh, we tried to improve the data visualization and navigation. Uh, functionality and how the, the actual website looks like and uh, the workflow. And I think uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Michael and Colin, will uh, walk you through some of these aspects uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but this is how, where, if you haven't been uh, to our website, this is the link. And this is, if you just Google HPAP, UPenn, you can uh, probably find uh, uh, the PankDB website. Um, this is the front page as as it looks like. Um, we have now uh, new artwork welcoming users, and uh, the major activities are actually distributed across these four large buttons that user can navigate pretty much every aspect of the website uh, as it's categorized in these uh, four major buttons. And uh, we try to update uh, our news page, uh, and including the number of donors and whether there has been any publications associated with PankDB and also uh, the Twitter page associated with HPAP is uh, demonstrated on the front page. And uh, the other three critical ways you can navigate uh, the website are these uh, three uh, drop-down uh, uh, menus that uh, various aspects of the website and data access and visualization and interaction is kind of uh, coordinated within these uh, three buttons, the data, information, workflow, and protocol, again, um, in, uh, you will, you will hear and see more of this, uh, in a few minutes. And, um, most importantly, uh, it, this is a free access and every, uh, if you don't have an uh, account already, uh, you are able to uh, create an account in a, a free and, uh, with no restriction. Of course, there are some uh, uh, agreements that the user needs to, to make to uh, create an account, but this is how you can navigate uh, the uh, creating account and login access. And um, various aspects of the website uh, demonstrates our parent organization and other useful links uh, for citation and also uh, contact, which you're uh, welcome to do so. We are really looking forward to hearing from you about your concerns and suggestions and recommendations, as this is really an ongoing work, and we are really looking for, forward to hearing from you and the community on how to improve this, uh, these efforts. Uh, so this is, uh, that's it for me, and I'm really thrilled to pass the uh, uh, screen uh, to uh, Michael Stoffer, uh, who will be uh, passing uh, uh, and continue with uh, Colin McGovern and talk to you a little bit more about how to use uh, PankDB in a more practical manner. So I'm going to stop sharing, and Michael, the stage is yours. All right. Well, thank you, Golnaz. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Yes, we do, all right. So uh, 
Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Stauffer. I'm one of the software developers here on the uh, PankDB uh, team in the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm going to take you through a couple of our new methods for learning about exploring the data, exploring the status of the data in the system, in the PankDB system, and also downloading the data for whatever, whatever use you may, you may have. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is our data status page here. It's available right from our home screen. Just takes a moment to load up. What this uh, page is primarily, two, two primarily primary goals. One is to show you the status of the data in the system, to know what we have and uh, what we don't have yet, and then also to let you download some of the data. Uh, but before I get into the details, I'm going to uh, talk about the idea of an experiment, because you'll see up here we, we call this an experiment matrix. So the concept of an experiment is important because we have such a heterogeneous data set. These are all our different assays that we collect and disseminate through the website. And each of them has different data types, different number of files associated with every run of the assay. So we use the idea of an experiment to make to provide sort of a meaningful grouping of data that is produced by a particular run of an assay for a particular tissue uh, sample for a particular donor. So for a donor, for a particular tissue sample from that donor, for a particular run of an assay, we have a group of a grouping of data that we call an experiment. It might be one file of data, it might be a thousand files. It really depends on the assay. And uh, so you might, for different experiments, you might, for sorry, for the same donor, you might end up with number of experiments available for a particular assay because the assay might be run on different tissue types, different cell types for that same donor. It might be run um, by different institutions using different machines or different protocols, or it might be run uh, just a, a replication experiment to, to reproduce the results. And we make all of those uh, available as separate experiments. Each, each one of those different criteria will produce a different experiment, uh, experiments worth of data. So uh, for example, single cell RNA sequencing uh, one machine might produce, you know, 100 files. Another might produce a thousand. If you have different numbers of cells in each run, you're going to get different numbers of files. So each one of those is groupings is going to be available as a single experiment. Now, this top part of the matrix here uh, shows you the columns here, each of the assay that we have available. You know, ATAC sequencing, calcium imaging. And then we're showing here the number of experiments that we have uh, available and uh, expected to come. So in the first row here called available, we see that we have, for example, 53 experiments available for ATAC sequencing assay, um, 556 experiments available for flow cytometry. Going down this row called pending, these are experiments that we expect to receive from the contributing institutions that we haven't yet received. Uh, the never row here means that for some reason, an experiment's worth of data is never going to be delivered. Maybe there was some problem with the uh, tissue sample, and I'll show you a little bit more about that shortly. And then in the revoked row, we, we see how many experiments we had at some point in the system, but that were revoked. And this is important because if you, if you find out that some experiment that you experiments worth of data that you used in your own experiments was revoked, uh, you're going to want to know that and know why it was revoked. And I'll touch a little bit more on that in a moment. The second portion of this table here shows you donor counts. So similarly, uh, we have uh, available donors. We have for ATAC sequencing, there's 33 donors for which we have some experimental data. And if I compare that up above with the experiment count, we have 53 experiments. So I know, you know we have, for some donors, at least two or more experiments worth of data available for ATAC sequencing. And these pending, never revoked uh, classifications here are the same for the donor counts as they are for the experiment counts. Let's look over here in the upper left of the page. Uh, we have some filtering options here. So what it's showing me right now is I'm seeing 120 donors worth of data for 100 of a total 120 donors that we have in the system currently. I can filter this, for example, by demographics, age, gender. I can filter by medical conditions. So let's, as an example, let's look at donors with uh, no diabetes, but that have a positive autoantibody 
uh, designation, which means that you know they might be developing or on their way to developing diabetes. So what happens when I select these is I see first off that I'm shown being I'm, I'm shown 17 donors out of the original 120, and everything over here in the table adjusts to this. So if there's any assays for which this donor set has no data, they're going to be uh, taken out of the view. And my experiment counts and the donor counts all change based on this filtering that I just uh, selected. So I have, for example, nine donors now instead of 33 with ATAC sequencing available. Um, there is some more filtering. I'm going to clear this and show you this last filtering option. This, this third filtering option called data features works on the experiments themselves. So some experiments are generated by different institutions. Uh, for example, if I want to look at all the data generated by the University of Pennsylvania, I just select this. And uh, right now I see I have 1,855 experiments worth of data available generated by the University of Pennsylvania um, for single cell, sorry, for ATAC sequencing. For example, I have 49 experiments available. If I switch this now to show Stanford, uh, there's, they run fewer assays, so the table changes the formatting a bit. I have four experiments available for ATAC sequencing and 143 pending. So you can drill down into the data a bit this way uh, using this filtering option right here. I'm going to clear everything again. So now we're looking at all the donors and all the experiment types. Scrolling down, this the lower half of this table shows me all of the data availability by donor. So HPAP one, two, three, four. As I hover over the donor names, I can get a little a quick pop up with some of the details of the demographic, uh, of the medical and demographic information for this donor. Now going by again by assay type here, I can see that each of these cells is giving me some information about the availability of the of the donor, the donor's information in the system. The color coding is the same as above. And if I click on this button, I'm viewing only available data for these donors or only pending data, only data that's never expected and similarly for revoked data. But let's go back to the view that shows all of this uh, data status in one view. And as, as <clears throat> to show some details under ATAC sequencing here, I can see this donor says there are two experiments available, three pending and one, which is the light gray here, that's never expected. And I get a little pop-up for that shows me that the reason for this uh, experiment is never expected is because there was insufficient material. If you need more details about this for some reason, you can contact us and we'll put you in touch with the generating institution or let you know whatever details we have already. Now you'll see the total here for this one assay for this one donor is six experiments. So this tells us that the, in, in particular for this, we know that there's multiple tissue types and, and cell types that are uh, processed using ATAC sequencing. So that we get multiple experiments in that way. Uh, I also know, and I can show here that there's multiple generating institutions. So for example, University of Pennsylvania has generated two experiments worth of data for donor one, and, and they were the one who had some uh, tissue sample that couldn't be used for the experiment. Stanford University for ATAC sequencing here for donor one has three experiments worth of data that is pending. So that's why you might see an example of multiple experiments for a particular donor for a particular assay. Now, uh, the last bit about this page is I wanna show you how you can download some data. So if I just highlight any of these cells that Shows, shows me a highlighter run, it means that there's some data available to download. If I click on it, it gets selected for download. I can download individually for each donor. I can download and, and select all of the histology data for all of the donors and all of that gets selected and highlighted. I can download for a particular donor. I can grab all of their data this way, just select it like that. And as I'm selecting data, up top here, we have some details about the selections. I, I've selected 33 experiments from three donors, and that's 186 gigabytes of data. You can quickly get into lots of uh, large data download sites here. Now, if I'm satisfied with my selection here, I can go over to these buttons and I can download 
all of this data via an SFTP script. That's a secure FTP script. Uh, if I click on it, I'll show you very quickly. I just get a bash script. So this is a script that I can run in any shell that's capable of running a bash script or an SH script. And it shows me a list of the files that I've selected and lets me run this off, offline, basically off the website um, using the standard SFTP protocol. You do have to register first for us if you want to use this because we need a, a public private key set up and you will take your public key. If you go into the login settings here, this is, I'm logged in here as Michael Stauffer. I go to FTP download. There's some instructions for how to do this. If you have trouble with this for some reason, just get in touch with us and we'll help you out. There is another download option if I have some data that has a smaller data size. For example, I've selected all the calcium imaging data. That's five megabytes. I can download it directly through a zip file. We'll let you do that if the download is less than five gigabytes. This is just for practical reasons. Um, so that's it for this donor status and download page. Now I'm gonna take you to the cell and tissue download page. This is gonna be a similar kind of matrix, but it's organized differently. But first, just let me say that the same filtering options are available here. And if I choose some options here, for example, type one uh, diabetes donors, and I switch back between the two matrices, uh, these are gonna persist. So it's a, it's a nice way to jump back and forth, see what donor is available for a particular donor set. And then let me see what data is available. And then I might come here to actually do the downloading. Uh, this page organizes the data by cell and tissue type. You can see here there's a section for cell types and the six, uh, section for tissue types. We have the same assay types here as in the previous matrix, and we have the same download section. here. Now, this is just because sometimes you might be available, I mean, sorry, interested in, let's say, alpha types. So for type 1 uh, diabetes donors, I can see that I have uh, these experiments available that have been organized and categorized as, as working on the, the alpha cells, ATAC sequencing and the, and the WGBS. And similarly for tissues, if I'm interested, for example, in spleen per se, I can see all the experiments and assays that are available for the spleen. You'll see some of these uh, experiments have a little, the counts have a little asterisks next to them. That means that the runs for these uh, tissue types have been also been categorized as having a particular cell type. Up here, I can see B cell. If I hover over it, this pop-up says that these are also listed under tissues as type spleen. And similarly type here, tissue, uh, the, the spleen tissue has been also categorized as, as B cells. And if I want to download data, I can click on the data and select it for download similarly deselect it and I get the same kind of status and download options up here at the top of the matrix. Now that's it. Um, yeah, that's it for this page. Lastly, for downloading, I'm going to show you an older method that we had where we listed everything just by the donors. You can see uh, these are the donors that actually have type 1 uh, diabetes. And if I drill down a little bit, I can see the actual files that are available for this particular donor, for this particular assay type. And this might be interesting. Uh, this is basically our file hierarchy on the system. If This might be interesting if you want to see what the file hierarchy is like before you download, or maybe you want to download just particular files for some reason to save on download time. But generally, this, this method is not going to be interesting. Now, lastly, I want to show you our donor information page available up here from one of our top tabs. Donor information shows you details about every donor that we have. On the first page, it's just a top level overview of the donor. The uh, filtering options persist here as well. If I want to go drill in, for example, to donor three, I get to this selection of tabs that have different details. So, this is the demographic excuse me, and clinical information about a donor, I can look at the details there. Uh, if I want to look at the imaging mass cytometry, I have a simple imaging viewer here. And this is where we partner with some of our uh, collaborating institutions. We provide some links out to their websites where they have extra uh, utility or extra information that we don't have currently 
on this website. So you can see that we provide a link to the Pancreas Atlas website. They have a, a more detailed and more capable imaging viewer for this same type of imaging mass cytometry data. And this will link you to their website for this particular HPAP donor. Similarly, for histology imaging, we can link out to the Pancreas Pancreat Atlas website for their viewer. Uh, islet functioning, we can link out to the IIDP. They have more uh, islet perfusion data there and viewing capabilities. And lastly, for sequencing data, we can link out to the CMDGA site where they have uh, capability to view some of the sequencing data and uh, different capabilities for data. So that is my presentation. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Colin, who's going to talk to you about some of our visualization tools. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Colin. And um, so one of the goals with the most recent uh, PankDB update was to have processed single cell RNA-seq data available to researchers. Um, so we go to the data and then experiment data download. Um, we can download the, the raw single cell RNA-seq data. Um, but now on the website, we have it uh, processed. So pro processing the single cell RNA-seq data takes uh, some training to, to know how to do. And then even if you have the training, it, it takes uh, some time to perform. Um, if you don't know what uh, single cell RNA-seq is, um, is an assay in which for each cell in a given sample, um, it's the, the expression of each gene is quantified. Um, this, not, this not only allows us to see a sample's uh, transcriptome, but also lets us see into the cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity. Uh, our colleague, Abhijit Patel, processes the raw single-cell RNA-seq data. And for transparency and reproducibility, his workflow is available underneath workflow protocol and then single cell RNA seq analysis. Uh, the processing of the raw data uh, included the incarnation of the experiments, QCing out the bad cells out of the experiment, uh, normalizing the gene expression uh, counts, and then also uh, cell classification. Um, the output of his uh, processing is available underneath the data and then interactive analysis. Um, on this page, we have two data sets available for download and then also a link to uh, cell by gene, which is how we're able to interact with uh, the single cell RNA seq data in the browser. So this, this First object is uh, done with the Surat library in R. R is a popular uh, bioinformatics uh, coding language. Uh, the second data set is uh, in data format, which is compatible with Python, which is another um, popular bioinformatics coding language. And then finally, I'm going to show you guys the cell by gene web application by clicking go. So the, the program called Cell by Gene, it's not specific to single cell RNA-seq. Um, it can be used to show in the, uh, to browse single cell, many different kinds of single cell data in the browser. Um, it's written by uh, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So, so the way that it works is that the plot in the center, each dot, represents one of the 222 cells um, from the, the data. Each cell has gene expression for each of the around 200,000 genes. Um, and then the, the cells, the way that they're plotted is that they use something, they're plotted by using uh, something called the UMAP algorithm. The UMAP algorithm, uh, find cells that have related gene expression, clusters them together, and then projects it onto two dimensions so that it can be visualized in a plot. Cells that are clustered together, for example, here or here, are related in gene expression, um, but the proximity between different cells is only a rough estimate of how related they are to each other. 
Um, for example, like let's say that this this cell versus this cell and this cell versus this cell are the same distance to each other. That does not mean that they are the same amount of different uh, in terms of gene expression. On the left, we have the cell annotations. And on the right, we have uh, gene expression information. So first I'm gonna show you the cell annotations. So for cell annotations, we have uh, cell type, which is a SINAR, alpha, beta, delta, et cetera. Um, we also have disease state, autoantibody positive, control, type one diabetes, type two diabetes. And then we also have HPAP ID, which is the donor ID for each individual donor that went into this uh, data set. So what we're able to do is that if we click this uh, droplet icon, now the plot is colored by cell annotation um, and then, or by cell type. So you can see that we have a center alpha, beta, delta. We do the same thing for disease state and we do the same thing for donor ID. Now, when we have, I'm gonna highlight by disease state now. And when one cell annotation is, like the plot's colored by one cell annotation, for the other cell annotations, we can see the proportion of cells that are in that annotation. For example, if we look, have it colored by disease state, and then look to this colored bar here for beta cells, we can see that we have a lot of control beta cells some uh, type two diabetes and some uh, anti -antibody, auto antibody positive um, beta cells. But this very, if you can't even see it, this, we only have a very small amount of type one diabetes uh, beta cells. So next I'm gonna show the gene expression navigation bar on the right here. <clears throat> So I'm going to search up the gene CPA1. CPA1 is a gene which is unique to uh, acinar cells in the pancreas. Um, I may refer to uh, genes that are unique to a specific cell type as marker genes. So if I use that term, that's, that's what it means. So first, I'm going to use the droplet icon. And when I do that for gene expression, the plot is now colored by the amount of uh, CPA1 expression, where the light green represents um, little to no expression of CPA1, while the more purple and blue color represents high expression of CPA1. And if you look at the plot, the, the top right hand corner is, is where we have some more expression of CPA1. Now we have a small histogram here, which shows us the distribution of um, CPA1 expression in our data. And I can, explain, I can expand this distribution by pressing this expand icon. And the way that this plot works is that on the x-axis is the amount of gene expression. And on the y-axis is the number of cells with that amount of gene expression. So we can see that there we have many cells with zero expression of CPA1. And then I don't know if you guys can see that, but we have some other cells with a larger amount of CPA1 expression. So let's say I want to I want to highlight the cells that do not have zero expression of CPA1. I'm able to click and drag on this plot. And now only the top right hand corner of this plot is being highlighted. Now, let's say that I want to see this small area of the histogram in more detail. <clears throat> what I'm able to do is click this, uh, this bar plot icon, and I'm gonna clip out the, the, low, the, low percent, the low percentile and the very top percentile in order to see more detail. So I'm gonna do between see here, 85 and 99% press clip. And now we can see that uh, more detail into that, that histogram that was before was being over overshadowed by the large amount of zero reads. But now we can see more details about the expression of CPA1. For example, we can see that um, we have a, a group of cells here with 
more CPA1 expression. And then over here, we have a group of cells with less CPA1 expression. Um, and we're able to confirm that this top right-hand corner is in fact axinar cells by either looking at this small histogram um, next to cell type, or we're also able to highlight over the, uh, the, cell, the cell type and see that the, the group of cells in the top right-hand corner are the, are the cells that are being uh, highlighted. So next I'm gonna run uh, differential expression. Differential expression is using statistical analysis in order to see which genes are distinct for different groups of cells. So um, the question I wanna ask is, I wanna figure out uh, which genes are specific to healthy or center cells. So the way I'm gonna do this is that I'm going to highlight only control cells and alpha cells, or as in our cells. And use, by pressing this button up here, I'm gonna put that into the first group. And then I've, I'm gonna compare the control or center cells to all the other cell cells in the data set by selecting all cells, then deselecting our center cells and having that as a second subset. And then I'm gonna start the analysis by uh, pressing this Venn diagram button. And the analysis is gonna start running. Now this does take some time uh, because we are comparing the transcripts, genes transcripts of uh, 25,000 versus 81,000 cells. Um, we bought a dedicated server just for uh, the cell by gene application. So we do, this does give uh, researchers more computational power. Um, but even with that, it does take some time to run. So I'll wait for it to run. I'm gonna uh, reset the uh, clipping of continuous values back to 0 to 100. Um, and then one feature I did not show was that, um, so let's say that we're highlighting by cell type uh, and we don't feel like we're, uh, memorizing each of the different uh, cell, uh, like the colors for each different cell classification. Um, I'm able to click this bullet drop down list. And now, oh, let me run this again. Uh, the bullet drop down list. And now we can see that it's highlighted by um, each different, the, the, the labels of each different group are on the plot. Let me see our center cells, ductal, ductal cells, alpha cells, um, and others. So we we'll put the differential expression to run. And it's going to finish any moment now, hopefully. Hmm. Interesting, it's taking so long. Um, okay, so while I'm gonna wait for that to finish, I'm going to do, here, I've never experienced that before. So I, I, have, I have something prepared to um, show what the results would be if it, if it did run successfully. So I'm gonna search up PRSS1. And this is also a marker gene of, um, which we call it, of our center cells. So I'm gonna put, I wanna, I wanna compare the, the uh, expression of PRSS1 cells versus the expression of CPA1 cells. And I'm gonna do this by uh, putting PRSS1 on the x-axis, and then putting CPA1 on the y-axis. And then we're going to see that this plot launches up. Again, each of the 222,000 dots on this plot represents one cell. On the x-axis is uh, the cells from the lowest to the highest expression of PRSS1. And then on the y-axis is the cells from the lowest the highest expression of CPA1. So what I'm um, able to do, oh, so, so we can see that the correlation between CPA1 and PRSS1 um, is 
clearly positively correlated. And that makes sense because they're both uh, genes that are unique to our center cells in the pancreas. So let's say that I want to, uh, I'm, I want to confirm that this positive correlation exists in all disease states um, in the data. So what I'm able to do is I'm gonna color by disease state. And now we can see the different disease states in the, the, the gene comparison plot. And I'm able to, to uh, highlight or see better the different disease states by highlighting over them in on the sidebar. So autoantibody positive has positive correlation. So does control type one diabetes and type two diabetes. Now, when I highlight over to different uh, disease states, the, the coordinates of each cell doesn't change. The only thing that does change when you highlight over the cells is that different groups of cells are uh, brought up to the top. So now if the uh, differential expression did run successfully, um, let me see if I can zoom in here. If the, if the differential expression of the uh, control of center cells and the control all other cells worked, um, this is what the results would, would look like. So you know, the top differentially expressed gene would be PRSS2. The next one would be REG1A, then PRSS1, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the data set here. I'm gonna remove the plot. And now let's say that um, I'm only interested in researching uh, the alpha and beta cells in the control data set, or in the control alpha and control beta cells. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to highlight just alpha and beta cells and then uh, highlight just the control cells. So now only alpha, beta, and control are highlighted. And then I'm going to press this slice out of pi button. And now we're only going to see the alpha, beta, and disease uh, control cells in the data. <clears throat> I'm going to color this by cell type. Now we can, um, you can select the cells by selecting them in, by um, by the cell annotation. But another way we're able to select the cells is by using something called the lasso tool by clicking up here. And now I'm going to select uh, two different groups of cells. So I'll, for the first group, I'm going to choose alpha cells, and I'm going to circle around the left group, make sure they're alpha cells and have this as the first group for differential expression. And then next, I'm going to uh, circle around the right group of cells, which are the beta cells, and have that as the second group. And now I'm going to press the Venn diagram button again. And hopefully this time the differential expression will successfully. Um, other than the lasso tool, there's also the magnifying glass tool that allows us to zoom in and zoom out of the data, as well as pan around and do the data better. Um, if we want to now see all the data, then we can uh, choose this full pie button and see all the data, um, all the data in the this data set again. And now we're gonna wait for this. Gene expression or the wait what happened? Oh, now it worked. Nice. Uh, so now we have the gene set. The first one was the alpha cells, and we can see that the top differentially expressed gene is glucagon. And for the second uh, group, we can see that the top differentially expressed gene is insulin. And so what could happen is that if we're running many different uh, differential expressions to query the data. Um, this set, this list of uh, gene sets can get quite large. Um, so what I'm able to do is I can call the first group uh, beta, or sorry, the second group beta, and I can call the second group alpha. And that's all I have to present.
Um, thank you so much, uh, Michael and Colin. I just want to share uh, the acknowledgement slide. It's going to be very quick, and uh, we look we really like to hear from you. Uh, as you can imagine, this is really a team effort and we are uh, really um, fortunate to work with an amazing uh, group of individuals, particular people who have made major contributions uh, to this work but didn't present today are uh, Dong Bohu and uh, Nilanjana Samantha and uh, Bobak Fariobi who is not here and also Abhijit Patil in my lab who actually uh, really uh, work very hard for the single cell uh, RNA-seq analysis. And of course, I want to thank the leaders of HPAP, Dr. Naji and Kastner, and uh, really, really grateful to Hearn and NIDDK for supporting this work. I uh, just want to have a final shout out to Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for promoting open science and really enabling us to use the code that they developed and uh, implemented on PANCDB such that this type of interactive work uh, is possible. And we are working with them to uh, continuously implement the in, uh, multimodal uh, data analysis and integrative work such that as these technologies are uh, developing, uh, we can also uh, enable users to interact with the data. So with that, I'm going to stop and would uh, love to hear from you guys. Uh, if you I, I pass it to uh, Joyce. Excellent. Thank you, both Niles, Michael, and Colin. That was a wonderful overview of, of, of your great system. So um, if anybody has any questions, would you like to raise your hand and unmute? <clears throat> or you could put it in the chat, but it's sometimes a little easier to just interact verbally. Questions? Joyce, I have a question for Colin, uh, I, th I think. Yes, John. Uh, Colin, when you were showing that example, it looked like it was either R Markdown or it might have been a Jupyter notebook with the um, processed data. Am I am I correct? And is is the actual Markdown file that shows how you processed it is that also made available to uh, to users? Um, you're talking about the uh, workflow. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. So the I'm not sure if the uh, the it's it's written in R. I'm not sure if the, the, the raw script is available for download, um, but that would be difficult to do. Um, but the code that was ran for each step is in the uh, website uh, page. I, I can comment maybe about that because this is what Abhijit did. Yes, we, I think what we have is an HTML file uh, describing the methodology. We can certainly provide the R markdown maybe on the GitHub page for uh, HPAP and kind of facilitates such that people just easily uh, download that and just be able to reprocess uh, the data either following R steps or just modifying them. I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you, Golnas. Thanks, Colin. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other comments or questions? I think it's amazing how much analysis you can do interactively online. That's a really terrific addition. So that's great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, again, I really want to emphasize that uh, we will not be successful if we can if we don't hear from you and we don't get feedback on how uh, we can improve and what are maybe the community's needs again um, with these type of technical uh, um, data sets there is a range of expertise but we hope that we kind of tailor towards uh, various skill sets you know again uh, the raw data that michael showed you how to download are for those who would like to get to the bottom of fast few files and redo all the analysis and the uh, integrative analysis that uh, Colin showed you is really uh, for you to just type in your gene of interest if you work on particular pathway to be able to very quickly within minutes to get the answer whether it's upregulated, downregulated, which cells is expressed. So please contact us. We would love to hear from you and uh, hopefully in future we can give you updates on even more progress on this front. 
Thanks, I'll just give you one more challenge. Do you have any um, thoughts or plans for a V3? <laughs> any next enhancements that you're doing? Yes, we're already actually pretty busy on that front. Um, uh, one of our efforts is actually uh, connecting um, both bulk uh, genomic experiments and also the single cell assays that uh, Michael showed you in connecting to genome browser views, uh, such as Washington genome browser, UCSC genome browsers. Actually, Dongbo is working very hard on facilitating that, that is kind of de taking, you, uh, taking the data on uh, PankDB and utilizing it on some other browser uh, viewers kind of like sale by gene by for but for bulk uh, data sets but the bulk can can again come from bulk experiments or creating pseudo bulk of the cells that are annotated using single cell in a way it's kind of we are doing some sort of sorting for you in a, um, a synthetic way using all the donors and trying to create an average plot by connecting the data to the genome browser so that's one of the features that we are uh, working very hard to implement in the in the next update that'll be great okay if there are no further questions, I just want to thank you all again and congratulations on the new release. Looks terrific. And we'll see you at an, another webinar in the future. Please try to join us Ju July 21st for the Hearn uh, webinar on the resource browser. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.